Um, when he, Jason asked me to come and talk, and I said, well, do you want me to talk about it? And he said, I don't care. And I said, wow, this sounds like a sacrament meeting. Great. <laughs> you do whatever you want, but don't do that. So I am going to go. I wanted to talk. First of all, let me introduce myself. Chris Briggs. I'm a creative director for a division of Verizon. Verizon Digital Media Services is our group. Um, and it's not the phone company, but we are owned by the company that owns Verizon Wireless. So Verizon corporate has a bunch of different divisions. One of them is wireless, which is the big behemoth part that owns 50% of everybody's cell phone within the United States. The other divisions are more of a technology division, and Verizon Digital Media Services sits in that group. We are responsible for helping major broadcasters get their content from the studio to anyone online on any device that they have on. So if you're watching TV on your uh, MacBook right now, you're doing it because you're using our services. If you're using Hulu, you've used Hulu in the past, or ABC, or ESPN, or any of those major broadcasters, they certainly use Verizon Digital Media Services. So that's just a little bit of who I am, and I work in the marketing team of what I'm going to call DMS, or Digital Media Services. So, um, but I came to that position through a lot of changing jobs. Jason and I were joking earlier that I can't hold a job longer than three years. And as you'll see through this little presentation, that's probably true. Three to five on a good day. So I started, let's go back to 1991. I just out of college, moved to LA. I got hired by a company called LA Gear. The other thing you'll find out in this presentation is every company I work for is no longer in business. So <laughs> it's bad for Verizon, I think, in the long run. But, um, LA Gear hired me to, I knew about computers. I had done some work with Macromedia Director and I knew how to do kiosks and I knew how to use the major programs. And so I was involved with helping their design team use that software. It had, a lot of it had just come out. The Mac really had just come out and was being used in marketing teams um, in a reasonable uh, representation. Before that, people were setting type and sending it out. People were doing their own illustrations and you're doing presentations on actual slides. So I kind of, I saw an opportunity, and this is I think one of the key takeaways, is I saw the opportunity for technology to change what we were doing in our department. And so I, when the first Mac 512 came out, I took it home and I started learning how the operating system worked. And I started playing with that computer to see what it could do for typesetting and, and for all these other things. When Macromedia came out as this cool flash, pre-flash kind of animating tool, I started playing with it to see how it could be, we could use it for creating kiosks and displays. <coughs> and so I jumped on board with that, and then of course the Adobe packages that everybody uses probably 99% of the time, Adobe Photoshop and Adobe Illustrator, were very important, and so I jumped onto those. Now if you remember, you probably don't, anybody alive in 91? <laughs> in 91, Illustrator and Photoshop were very basic. Photoshop didn't have layers, we had to use tools to kind of work that, so you couldn't really, if you change something on your Photoshop file, it changed the entire thing, and it was lost forever. The, um, and Illustrator was the exact same way. So I stayed at LA Gear for a few years and kind of worked with them, and then I got asked, uh, this catapult shoe is just so everybody knows that they're a shoe company. Right? They were a shoe company. They still, you can actually get the shoes now, but it's, it's a whole different thing. And then I moved up to um, Cupertino, where I worked for a company called CKS Partners. CKS, because of the experience I had with what I had done with LA here, was this marketing team of really smart young people who were working with clients um, that were everyone from United Air Airlines all the way to Apple. We had a lot of work to do with Apple there. And one of, the, one of their main projects that they had was the rebranding of United Airlines. So I worked on the team to help use the tools and get figure out what we could do to change the airplane from what it was pre 95 to the post 95. And again, now if you look at United Airlines, this branding's all gone too because of the Continental merger and all the other things that they do. So, you um, worked with them. One of the fun projects that I had when I was at CKS was an interesting precursor to the iPhone, which was the Newton. So, Apple was driving to make these personal digital assistants. They came up with this message pad called the Newton. And my job was to try and figure out a way to, using my multimedia skills, to figure out a way for this Newton to sell itself in the store. Because there were no Apple stores at that point in time. 
people were buying products when they go to CompUSA or they go to Best Buy or something like that, and they'd see the product, and it would have to tell its own story. And so I used animations. We didn't really know how to use this product because it had very little memory and very little uh, tools available to it. So we kind of built our own technology to do an in-store demo that would run consistently hour after hour, week after week, and tell its story. It was kind of fun because we were working at CKS. We are always using new technology and seeing what was available and then taking that new technology and saying, OK, this is what Apple tells me I can do with it. Let's get the engineers together and let's see what else we can do with it. And so we worked with a bunch of really, really smart people to do that. The other thing that happened was CKS had bought a division of Apple at that point in time, which was the Apple TV group. And so we moved into their facility and became what we called CKS Interactive. This, a, this was when the dot com was just taking off. And Interactive really was a fun name that everyone wanted to be associated with. And so we called ourselves CKS Interactive and we built CD ROMs, a bunch of CD ROMs for clients, specifically a lot for Apple. Apple came out with the Performa computer, which was the in home, all in one little box. And so we did a bunch of demos with these guys. One of the things we, again, had to tell the story for was how does it work? Um, how can you tell a story in a way that's not just text sliding across the screen? So we, we used the TV studio there to, um, to photograph a, one of our employees or to video one of our employees telling the story. And then we miniaturized her and put her kind of like a Willy Wonka in the chocolate factory her on the screen as she talked about how the computer worked. And so it was, it was a fun little project, and it worked out really great. And we started doing lots more of those kind of things. But then one of the characters in my office, Bruce, came up to me and said, hey, Chris, there's two things about Bruce that are important. Bruce is a super smart guy and an engineer and could do DVDs better than anybody I knew. But he also was pushy as all get out. So I remember when I hired him, he came I had interviewed him once, and he sent his resume, and he kept talking to me. And then one day, I looked up from my desk, and there he wasn't in front of me. He said, hey, I'm here for a job. And I'm like, Bruce, I didn't hire you. And he said, I don't care. I still want to work here. <laughs> and so he knew what we were doing, and he wanted to be there. And so he pushed his way in and passed security and everybody else and showed up actually right in front of me. I, I gave him credit for that. I don't know if I would do that again if I was Bruce. But he was, he was such a good guy and a smart guy that it worked out for him. The other thing he did was. I was working on a project for Apple, and we were trying to get it all finished. And he said, hey, Chris, come over to my desk. Let me show you something new. Let me show you this cool new thing. And I'm like, OK, great. What is it, Bruce? Thinking he's got a better way to do a DVD. And he shows me the, the internet, you know, Mosaic, basically, at the very beginning of time. And I said, Bruce, that's never going to fly. So let's not worry about that. Let's continue with what we're doing. So Bruce knew what it was that was interesting. He pushed hard, and I, and I blew it. There's probably two or three points in my life where I really made a mistake. One was to not be interested in what Bruce was showing me at that point in time. And, uh, but it worked out great for him, and it worked out, actually, we all know where the industry went. So in 1995, I had been at CKS for long enough, and I was asked to join a, company, a little tiny startup called Eagle River Interactive, which later became um, agency.com, which is a larger marketing firm. Eagle River Interactive was a small little company. We had an office in Vail, Colorado. That sounded great to me. I could ski and we could hang out and we'd do, again, web stuff and DVDs and, and things like that for our clients. We didn't really have any clients at the point in time, but we had a good sales team that helped to build that out. So we worked on early internet projects. One of them was the Pioneer project. Pioneer came to us and said, hey, we want to get involved in this internet. How do we make it work? And we said, well, you can't really buy anything. You can't really do a lot of graphics and stuff. So let's use it as a comic book kind of idea. Let's use it to s tell a story about why you're different and how you're better. And so we started drilling down in what the story of Pioneer was, what the history and kind of build a character and this crazy doctor, I can't remember what his name was, Dr. Rollins. And it, and it worked out that they loved it. And it got traction both in the press and also the people who were interested in looking at their products were involved much better because we were telling a story as opposed to just putting a brochure online. And so we did that for a few years. I worked at um, I worked at Eagle River until 98 when in 98 we merged again with agency.com. Um, 
this, this was probably the second worst thing I did, was I moved to New York City and decided I would be the uh, creative director for the New York City office. So we had over 100 graphic designers and a bunch of people who were all interested in moving up in the world, and we were doing um, websites most of all the time. British Airways, MetLife, a bunch of clients that were um, interested in what we were doing, uh, and so they came to us and we worked with them. What, what, I found, what I found I was doing with 100 employees was I was just doing paperwork all day long. I was interviewing, reviewing, firing, hiring, doing junk that I wasn't really interested in doing. And so I made, a, I made a, a kind of a terrible decision that that wasn't, coming there was a, not a great decision for me because it was the right thing technically, it looked good on a business card, but it wasn't what I was passionate about. And so I kind of took a step back and said, is this really what I want to do? Is, do I want to be involved in in building the team and working with them, or do I want to do creative work at the same time? And so I moved away from them, and I decided it's time to go client side. And so I jumped over to um, a client, which was about .com. They called me and said, "Would you be willing to do the creative? You just uh, would you be able, willing to run a creative team there?" And it was a small in-house team, which was fun. About .com is a how many people even know what that is? Anybody? Okay, thank you. It's still around. It. Uh, it was a company that was founded by, rather than having Google be your search engine, they used professionals who kind of knew the industry and they would bring up the right pages for you if you're searching on a certain topic. Everything from the LDS church, where they had a curator for that, to um, any medical condition you'd ever want. They had people who were involved in that. And they would pay these curators to curate the right traffic and or the right kind of content so that it was useful and they would make advertising uh, dollars through that. So about.com came to me and they said, hey, we just changed our name from Mining Co. and we need to clean it up. And so this is a mess. They had this kind of brown, green, ugly color website and they had a new logo that they just slapped on top of it. And so we, over the next couple of months, we just worked our way to get something that was at least cleaner, but it was still a mess because it was like whatever you see is a bunch of text and it was the way the internet was. So, if you look at where it is now, with its most recent one, it's much more picture oriented and it's kind of related to a design that fits more of the internet and the way it works. So through the process, we pushed as hard as we could, we made some changes, we redesigned a few things. Um, one of the things I, I this is okay, third, third worst thing in my life I ever did was I tried to change their logo without telling them that. So as a creative director, I felt, you know what, that ball is really not drawn right. If you were a sphere and there was a shadow underneath that sphere, there, the shadow would be on both sides of that sphere. And if the light was hitting that sphere, it wouldn't hit it in one point and then kind of fade out. This, this was a cheap Adobe Illustrator way of making a ball in a sphere, and I thought, that's wrong. So let me change it, let me modify it and make it so it looks right. So I did that, and then one night we're showing the annual report to the designer, or to the president of the company, and he just kind of looks over and says, that logo's different. And I said, yay, you notice it looks better, doesn't it? He, Nearly within, I was within 20 seconds of being fired at that point. Just because I made a decision that I thought was useful and I thought I could get away without talking to anybody about it, but I, not the great way to do it. So we pulled back, we made the logo the way it was, we left it the way the way they had it. But then lo and behold, a couple years later after I left, if you look at it now, the ball is the way it should have been. So, so I, I still take a little bit of pride in that. I was just ahead of my time and I forgot to tell someone about it. <laughs> So I was, at, I, was, I was there for a few years, and then, as Jason and everybody always says, the church came calling. And the church said, hey, we really want to get involved in the internet. No matter what, it's going to be something that we need to be part of. And so they had a division they had just bought from Bookcraft called MSTAR, which was the, which was the internet division of Bookcraft. And so it was a group of us, Jason. When did you come on board there? Uh, the end of 1999. Okay. So, there's a group of people who were really smart, and we we're all here in Utah County trying to figure out what we did. I flew, I moved from New York to Utah. I wanted to get back to the mountains anyway, so it worked out fine. We built the very first Mormon.org. I can't tell you how many committee meetings we went to, how many presentations we had to do to get to this level of design work, right? Not the greatest thing. But what we found was when we were building this, Dave Nielsen, who was the instructional designer on the project, and you worked with Dave at that point in time, I'm sure, and Mark Hemingway, who was the client representative from the missionary department, 
we all sat down together and we tried to figure out what's the best way to, how do you tell the church's story or what people are interested in in a way that is useful and can be taught on the internet. And so without too much technology, without a lot of bandwidth, how do you do it, right? If you're gonna, if you're gonna make it work. So go back to your old dial-up modem days or your AOL kind of noise and try and tell the story. Um, we broke it up into very small little chunks. So we tell one concept, then we give the user three or four different options what they could do from that concept. And then we, so we, we started building this and it became this huge spider web of content. And it was really fun to do because it's what we all did when we were missionaries and kind of, it's a fun way, it's the way you tell the story if you're a, a full-time missionary. You wouldn't dive into a long 45 minute explanation. You break it up into little pieces and get those concepts understood. So we did that, and then what the church does really well is focus groups. We took it out to the to the communities. Um, I remember one focus group in Chicago where we went and visited with them. We had people who were not affiliated with the church and didn't know anything about it, but were open to the discussion. And so we presented them with basically this page, and we gave them three or four tasks to do. And then they'd come back and report, and we say, what did you learn? And we say, and, and it was amazing how much people could pick up from the way we had break, broken up that in, or that instruction. So that rather than trying to have them read everything, they read two or three things, but then you ask them, what did you learn? And they could give you the first vision story like they believed it and like it had always been their story. So it's really fun and a new way for us, at least for what we saw as the church, again, from, from what we had done at Pioneer and what we did here, was to make the story digestible, make it understandable, and make it at their pace so they can make changes in, in, in that decision as they go along. So I did that for a long time, worked on um, Mormon.org, then MSTAR, again, went away, got assimilated into the church, as often things like that do. So I worked, is assimilated the right word? <laughs> So I worked for the church. I, I moved to the audiovisual department where I you know, ran the, they gave me some crazy title, Graphic User Interface Design, E-Learning, and Multimedia Design. <laughs> it can't be any longer than that, so that's what I did. Um, major things we worked on was, from the very beginning, we had been doing LDS.org. We knew that it was for members, and so we continued to build out and make changes to LDS.org on a pretty much regular basis. Every six months, we were refreshing and adding to that. The other one we did was um, the welfare site called Provident Living, worked on a lot of that to kind of get teaching uh, individuals how to use their own skills that they have around them and how to find things within the church that would help them uh, in, in their own welfare needs. Um, so we, this team was probably 30, 30 maybe people in a little tiny room. We jammed this all together. It was, kind of, it was like a sweat box in the church office building. And it was completely different than any other um, floor on the church office building. They, they gave us brand new cubes, kind of this high-tech looking feel, but it was jammed in the middle of what was probably a conference room. And so, uh, but it was fun to work with. And then while I was there, I can't remember if it was before or after, but they asked me to come down to BYU and help to redesign some of the BYU pages. So, Again, this was way back when, when BYU was mostly text, and or BYU.edu was mostly text. And what I learned from my BYU experience was that if you work for administration, you don't get to do anything. You, you, can, you can suggest all day long what you think the website should look like for the business school or the law school, but they're the ones who own it. And so I was an administration employee creating designs that the different colleges had to implement. And the way for me to do that was to make sure that those colleges were involved from the very beginning. We got the, uh, we had focus groups, we had roundtable discussions, we had a lot of people from the major colleges come and talk to them, and I'd go and visit with them, and we'd come up with some sketches. They'd come back to me and say, well, that will work for maybe for the law school, but it won't work for business. How do we make that work? So it was a lot of communication, a lot of discussion back and forth. Um, we finally came up with some guidelines that worked for everybody, and it was surprisingly well received in that we could roll it out across the different colleges. Um, I worked for them for a long time. I remember one, going back to the church time, we were in a meeting at the conf at a, in a conference room, and it was my 
I saw Jason, I don't know if you were there, but Dave was there, and there was a bunch of other people from the audiovisual department, and Elder Perry came in. And I had worked with Elder Perry because he was involved also when we were M-Star days, and, and he was very hands-on. And I don't know if you know Elder Perry, he is a giant among men. He's six foot four and towering over everybody. And he came into the office, he had just, he came into the conference room and he had just seen, um, he was just doing some leadership training because it was around conference time, and he said, brethren and sisters, we got a problem. He said, you can build websites all day long, and you can put text in, you can translate the language, but there's a big portion of our people who can't read. There's a bunch of leaders who can't read. What are we going to do about the leaders who can't learn the way that we've been trying to teach them, you know, that don't have that physical ability? So he was... He looked at it and he knew exactly what needed to happen. And so he came to our group and he said, we need to start shooting smaller videos and do other things that would really help to um, train the individuals in a way that they're accustomed to learning as opposed to the way that we have been trying to teach. When I did those focus groups with Mormon.org, it worked out fine because we called out the people who couldn't read and we just said, we only want to talk to these individuals. But he saw it as a larger picture and knew that the church, as it's growing, and the speed that it was growing, and needed to have a different way of, of training. You can't hand out a manual to someone in Guatemala who can't even you know, read the first page. So we looked at different ways. We looked at uh, lots of different things, and we came up with video as being a solution. But video wasn't really viable as a streaming technology in most of the world. So great idea, a little ahead of his time. What are we going to do? I had been my five year mark working for the church, and as I said, three to five years is where I leave. And so I, I, uh, I knew there was in good hands with David and a bunch of other people who were working on it, and I got an opportunity to go work for a technology company in Lehigh, American Fork, called Move Networks. Now, Move Networks was a precursor to what we have at, um, at Verizon. And Move I, um, is a technology that a bunch of guys came together and came up with a better way of showing up, getting video on the internet. And everybody remembers, this is kind of a cruddy little chart, but in the original, um, if you clicked on a video file originally, it would buffer, 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 and then it would start playing. But if the network got in trouble, it would stop and start buffering again, right? You get the wheel and all that buffering, and then it would play again. What Move came up with was, let's cut that video up into two second chunks, make it in different bandwidth sizes, so when you hit play, it immediately starts playing at a really low bandwidth, but as, as the network gets better, if it does get better, then it will shift up to a higher resolution and get to its highest resolution. If there's traffic in the network, it just shifts back down again and starts playing. So if you watch video online, either live or video on demand, you'll see your video, when you first hit play, pretty, pretty low resolution, and then it jumps up. And this is now consistent, what we call variable bandwidth, variable bandwidth, and that is almost every video player uses this technology. So on a big sports game, there might be a point where, the, where it gets so hard to handle that it kind of squishes itself down and then and plays again. So this is the technology that Elder Perry wanted so that we could actually use this to um, teach uh, members all over the world. But before the church could get it, we needed to give it, we need, uh, Move Networks needed to sell it to all the broadcasters, and so all the broadcasters loved it. They, they used this for a long period of time. ABC was, again, one of their main clients. We did everything from a CW to Televisa down in, in Mexico. And just started becoming, this became the time where video really was viable. Um, before that time, when you're watching video, it was either posted side stamp or low resolution, and you had the buffering issues. So I worked with them for a long time. Move Networks was a VC funded company, and as most VC companies, they kind of bite off more than they can chew. We were burning a million dollars a month just on technology because they had to buy special hardware and install it in these special rooms and all this kind of crazy stuff. So we worked and continued to grow with Move Networks until it just became unmanageable and, and they kind of imploded on itself. The technology never went away, but the, the structure of the company went away. And it's now owned by Dish Networks. So, um, the next thing I did after I left Move Networks was I started my own division or my own company. This is a, a diagram of how video goes from the source all the way to the individual devices and then how analytics happen. Each one of these 
pieces as a separate silo of technology or different companies that do each one of those things. So with my own company, we really worked with these plus a bunch of other small technology companies to help them market themselves and sell their product to the product testers. When you're working with a technology company, one of the things you find out is they got a lot of PhDs, but none of those PhDs can tell the story. These are super engineers who know how to write code and can figure out what the system is, but they can't tell the story so that the broadcaster can really understand what they're serving. So we worked with them um, to make that work and, and did well enough, but then the church came calling, right? Two times. Second time back in. 2014, I went to the church and I lasted five months. Jason, I'm sorry. <laughs> five months was perfect. Uh, the project they asked me to work on, and it's still in production, two years later, three years later, is the church had a, had a, they had gone through the rebranding in 80, they came up with a new brand, the Jesus Christ being the major <coughs> point of the logo, but they couldn't trademark this. It was hard for them because there was no icon. This because this translated in all different languages, so you couldn't trademark one icon or one piece. So they asked me to work with the correlation team to look at different things that we could generate to have it trademarkable. Um, so all of our products and services had. So we did a lot of focus groups. We we looked at a bunch of different religious images and with our focus groups, and we talked to them. It was fun because this was really the first time I think the focus group team had ever gone to both members who were super active and members who were less active. And so we talked to all of them about what their experiences were and what their imagery was and what they thought about the church and how it worked. And so we could come up with some sort of design. I can't show you what the final is because three years later we're still working on the final. Three years. It's crazy. Anyway, um, I moved then after that. Verizon called and said, hey, we've seen what you did at Radiate. We saw what you did with Move. Can you come and help build out the team there and stuff? So let me show you just some stats that are, I think are interesting. Right now, 46% uh, of the internet, or 46% of the world has internet access, has the ability to watch it. There are 3.4 billion users in 2016. It's a growth that isn't slowing down. That it doesn't seem to be leveling off at any point in time. Um, There's some predictions coming up in 2019. 80% of the internet traffic will be video. So if you're not designing and building and thinking about how video is going to be, implemented in your instruction, then you're missing out where the internet is going to be. Uh, another thing they say about 2019 is that the amount of content that's streaming over the internet in one month, the amount of video content you can't watch in over, I think it's five million? Yeah, five million years. It takes five million years to watch the amount of content that will stream through that. And then of, of yeah, a lot of video. And then of that, the traffic, I think the lower right hand corner is the one I think. Uh, traffic is mostly going to be on mobile. How many people have a mobile phone in this room? Everybody. Is it their only? Is it your only phone? Right. Anybody have copper landline? Anybody? No one fell for the bundled package from Verizon. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. What used to be called cord cutters are now cord numbers. People don't subscribe to uh, as much cable and satellite dish networks anymore unless they're getting the internet. They really want the internet. Um, so not only are they getting internet directly to their home, but 66% of the people who are having mobile devices will be using that as their primary source for most of the video. So can you tell a story? Can you build an instruction? Can you do something in a free screen? That's where people are going to be and that's where we're, we as Verizon are looking to continue to move forward. The beautiful thing about Verizon is, remember this chart from before where we were working with a bunch of different clients. <clears throat> Verizon Digital Media Services really has all of these things now built in. So we can go to a broadcaster and say, you don't have to hire five or six different companies to do what you need to do to get to the consumer. And we at Verizon have it all. So come to us, we're the clients say we're the one throat to choke. In case there's a mistake, they will reach out to us and fix it. But it also gives them the reassurance that we know uh, that we know enough to get the process all the way to the consumer. And the beautiful thing about Verizon, as opposed to another technology company, is that we actually own the cell phone at the other end. So we have a lot of of the path to the consumer. Um, and with all that power, we have great responsibility. So we uh, it, it's it's fun to do. It's a great project to be part of. The one thing. Our tagline now is we're changing the way the world watches. 
but what does it really mean watches? We, we kind of thought it meant like, we're changing the way you watch television, but it really means the way you do everything because the system's in place now that anybody can watch 4K video and broadcast on their phone or on their laptop in any place they want, both video on demand or live television in a quality that's better, if not as good, better than what they can get on their satellite or the cable. And so we kind of given that the responsibility. Now, um, with that, there's you know, like that's my overview of how we got here. So I can open up for questions, but there's the four main things I think I learned from this was when you see the latest technology, you gotta you gotta try and figure out what it is because it's either gonna be really really important or it's not gonna be important. But you better know it and know what it's like. Everybody's talking about augmented reality right now, right? And what is that going to do? Pokemon Go made it popular, and so all the kids now know what, you tell them what augmented reality is, and they'll, they'll explain it. Yeah, we use it all the time. Uh, virtual reality is probably around. I'm not going to say it's going to be the main thing, but definitely it's some technology that we need to look at, and Verizon is looking very carefully at both of those pieces to see how does it fit within our own realm of understanding what can we do with it. But when I say you got to grab the latest technology, it's grabbing the latest technology from Adobe and, and um, even Microsoft. You know, if we learn how to use PowerPoint better, we can tell better stories. If we learn how to do other things, technology that's coming up, we, we can do better at what we're doing. Um, the other thing I always say is you got to work with the smartest team. If you look at if you look at the team you're working with and you're the smartest guy in the room, you're in trouble. You do not want to be the smartest, brightest guy. You want the other group to work with you and to build it out. That's why the instructional designers I worked with at the church were top notch. They knew what they needed to do and they could tell the story in a better way than I could ever figure it out. And so work with people who are smarter than you, who are willing to work as hard as you and kind of kind of be a team that way. As you saw from my 91 to here, be willing to move. We were joking about that earlier. I live in I work in LA, but I live in Salt Lake, and so this is my only opportunity where I haven't really fully moved to Los Angeles. But be willing to move. If, if a job says, or your career choice and your path says, go and do something different, go do that. Don't be stuck because of your emotional attachment to where you are. You know, I was at the church for five years and I could have stayed forever. A joke from President Kimball was always, way back when someone, he was riding the elevator and someone said, how many people work here? And his joke was, 50% of them actually work here. What? What? <laughs> what was it? How many people work at the church office oh. building looking for a number of thousands? And he said 50%. So, truly, I was in the elevator one day at the church office building. This is probably off color a little bit. But I, I saw a friend of mine and I asked him, he was carrying a lamp. And I said, Why are you carrying that lamp? And he said, Well, the new building has just been installed with motion detectors in every room. And so, if I sit at my desk for too long, the lights go out. And I thought, What kind of job do you have that you just sit at your desk? For that long a time where the lights, get, the lights go off, and he, he put a little lamp in so he would at least have light, and he didn't have to move. <laughs> Until 4.15 when the bus came, and then he could get up and go. Um, be willing to move. And then the last last thing I think that's important is really Verizon's tagline right now is better matters. Do things that are, that are making your life better or making the things that you're learning and the things that you want to do be better. If you're if you're just saying, ah, it's good enough, that's really, there's 80% of the world that's going to do that. But if you can make stuff that is um, different and changing the, changing the way you're looking at something, that's better, right? I always, the design teams that I work with, both creative and technology-wise, um, I, I require them to come up with three or four different ideas not just settle on the very first thing. Throw away your first two, come up with a couple more. It works out where after they've thought about the solution, they can actually get to a place where it's really an incredible place to be. And so working in technology where I have been for the last, from 90 until now, has been fun for me. It doesn't mean it's a thing for everybody, but I think these principles work for whatever job you're looking for. I have a son who works at Target, you know, and these things still work for him. Learn the technology, work with a great team. Make sure that you're willing to move when it happens and, and be better at what you do. So that's it. I'm open for questions. If anybody has anything, I see there's a group of people online. So, yes. Anybody? Jason? Can you talk a little more about Grab the Latest Tech? Because when Bruce showed you the internet, 
Yes. That worked out, but he could have showed you like 50 other things that didn't work out, right? And so the, there's a, there seems to be a potential that if you're always chasing the new thing, right. like most of those things are, are going to be gone six right. months from now, right? Yeah, so that's, yeah. no, that's, that's pretty clear. Grabbing the latest tech, you need to grab it to analyze it. Don't get enamored with technology that it becomes the most important thing. But if you can use it to tell your story, you can use it to do what your job is better, then do it. I wouldn't say, I mean, I think I made a mistake when it was the internet um, with Bruce because we were doing DVDs and we thought that was all you had to do. Or we did in-store kiosks and that's all you had to do. We didn't realize, I didn't see it as the internet could be a way of uh, uh, explaining that story in a much easier, much more cost-effective way. And I, I think if you look at it now, the internet's the way that we deliver all of our content. Nobody gets a DVD anymore. Except for Jason, who still buys DVDs every once in a while. Anyway. Um, so technology, you got to be in. You can't be enamored with it, but you have to look at it and evaluate it. Is it going to help me get to uh, what I need to do? And I think there's still a, a discrepancy. You know, um, VR is certainly a fun technology to play with, but I don't think it's been cracked yet of how it can do something um, so much better than other things. Shooting a VR, a, a completely immersive 360 film like National Geographic just did um, about the Civil War. Is a beautiful experience, but how do you how do you get focus to be to tell the story in a way that works for you as opposed to being straight on shot? Um, but I do think augmented reality certainly is, is an opportunity. I think another technology that came and now is probably gone is the whole QR codes. They were great for you know, a flash in the pan for a few years. Everybody was putting QR codes on everything, from business cards to coffee cups. Um, you don't see it as much because. It was more of a fun little piece, but it was useful at its time. I think there still are probably some opportunities for it. Does that answer that question? Okay, thank you. Yeah. I just had a follow up with that. Um, I've worked as an instructional designer for a bit, and I run into situations regularly where the. Grab the microphone. The, oh, sorry. Tried to get closer. Where the, the person I'm working for, the company, the, the administration, won't Do accept it. or you know, there's a cost associated with the latest tech. Right. Like we're working with a, a company right now where they have an antiquated proprietary LMS and they will and, and there's right. no, there's no hope for upgrading. <laughs> yeah. Um, did I mention being willing to move is one of your things? <laughs> <laughs> People invest so much in technology and certainly proprietary. And that was the problem with Move Networks. Move Networks is a great technology, but it costs so much to keep it going that it, it imploded on itself. Okay. The one thing that I think from that, from my experience there, I was able to take it and learn something else. All the technologists who built Move Technology now work for Verizon. Basically, they left, started their own company, knew what was wrong with it, fixed it, and sold it to Verizon. And I'm happy campers here in Utah County. So I, I, I think you are going to work for places where technology, and Bruce is my example again. I, I said to Bruce, don't do that. Don't, you, know, you can do it on your own time. Don't play with the internet while you're here at the office, because that's probably never going to be important to anybody. That was my mistake, because it is where it is. But I think you are going to find yourself in situations where you need to say, is the direction of the company the same direction that I want to go in? Or do I see something different, and can I, can I make that choice? So first of all, I tell my kids, and I tell anybody, never quit until you found another job because that's the worst thing you can do. Um, it's best to be employed when you're looking for more employment because people will always hire someone who's employed first. That's kind of that. But at the same time, look at your technology, find out if it works for you. Um, if, you can, if you can move them in a direction. When I started working at LA Gear, I was there just to help them learn how to use the software. I said, hey, look at this cool Macromedia director. Let's make some kiosks. And they were more than happy to do that. Verizon is a company that has a ton of money, so they're more than happy to look at new technology and new things to invest. And they're always looking at stuff like that. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, so I think it's cool that you have like experience in a bunch of different organizations. And I was wondering what your thoughts are about, you know, were there pros and cons to different ones, like maybe working for a bigger one versus a small one, or how the church or the church compared to the one. Just each, each of them have pros, certainly. Because when you're working for a division or a, a, a going on client side, you can focus your expertise. I work for Verizon, so I know exactly what I'm selling. And I know exactly how to massage and, and change the story so it goes and I can sell this to the broadcasters. 
working for an agency, you get a wider range of experiences. I worked for five or six different clients at the exact same time. So I could learn more from a wider range of people and work on a bigger team um, with different experiences, selling everything from, again, British Airways to MetLife. You, you knew what the underlying technology was, but you sell it differently to those different individuals. So I think there's pros and cons. I, I think you have to, um, again, emotionally be careful of what you attach yourself to so that the emotion of being um, there forever is kind of against your nature, or against my nature, of, um, I, I don't think anybody's going to have a lifelong career in one place. I think career is what we're doing as we're moving from place to place. i got two minutes. Anybody online? i got a nod, no. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry, just one more. Um, you, you, you'd mentioned earlier on that uh, with some of your the statistics that mobile and video are really going to be the the bigger portions of, of yeah. things, and that delivering content through there will will help you reach more people. Um, do you find in in what you've designed that even if video is not the best way to portray or to teach what you're trying to teach, it's better to use what everybody's using just so that they're comfortable with it and are more likely to see it and more likely to watch it. So a text-based and graphics-based teach learning man, or learning system as opposed to a video. I think you have to use both. I, I think people learn mm -hmm. faster by watching a video than they do through reading and other ways, unless you've done it a different way and I can't, I haven't seen it yet. Um, but for me, um, you have to be able to do both. I think you will exclude people if you're doing video in a low bandwidth area you know, that can't handle that kind of technology. Again, I'll use my Guatemala experience. If you go to Guatemala and you try and show them a, a 4K video, it's gonna take forever and it won't play very well. Um, so how do you train them? Well, you have to figure out another, another way to do it. I Just um, what we have seen at Verizon, again, is that the cell phone business that is make up 99% of what Verizon generates as revenue is going to be a utility at some point. The government's going to come down and say, everybody needs a phone, everybody has a phone, so we're now going to regulate the credit out of this company and kind of give everybody a level set. You see, even online now, every other week, it's Verizon offers unlimited, and then T-Mobile offers unlimited, and we offer it for $45, and T-Mobile offers it for $25. So we're all competing to get the customer because we want that customer we want to be in the pocket of the customer, right? And so once that happens, now that we have the customer and we're all regulated to a business, what can we do with that customer? And so training, educating, having content that we own. So Verizon just recently bought AOL. Yes, AOL is still around. Um, <laughs> we, we're in the process of buying Yahoo because Yahoo has some great content through Yahoo Sports, Yahoo Finance, and Yahoo whatever. Um, so we're looking at buying content and becoming more of a content play as opposed to just a technology play. Yes? I actually held up the sign of the wrong sign, so now you have five minutes. Oh, okay. There's also a question from Dennis. Dennis, what do you got? Um, He's trying. I see you, Dennis, talking. I can't hear you. <laughs> now, now you go. <laughs> Oh, you have it in the chat? Okay. What was your degree when you graduated in 91? I actually graduated much earlier than 91, but I didn't go that far back in my resume. Um, I went to Parsons School of Design. I studied graphic design as a major. Um, again, before even the Mac came out. So I was using a repair graph pens and studying type the old fashioned way. So as a graphic design major, I think that helped me from a visual point of view. Um, and I loved technology when it came out. I just kind of kept jumping on the technology. And how much your part of it has that played in your career? 100% of my career is because of the choice I made in college, right? Um, which isn't the case now. I hire people all the time who are philosophy majors or political science majors who are now coders, and they do just as well. So I think there's a difference in where I was from a graphic design point of view. I want, an il I want a designer who can illustrate, who can draw a straight line or a circle and actually make it look like a circle than I would with a, um, a coder who has a poli-sci major. I'm, I'm fine with that. As long as they can do what they need to do. Um, does that answer that? I hope that answers it. Okay. Anything else? We've got two more minutes. 
Otherwise, we're going to break early. All right. If you'll join me in thanking Chris.